And as soon as he identifies himself, you embrace him immediately. You see, Christ comes to save all the blind. Now, we're all blind, but some of us admit it and some don't. And the ones who admit it are those who have had their eyes open to their blindness, if you don't mind that expression. But Jesus didn't come to save those who were blind but thought they could see. That's where Christ's irony comes in. If you knew you were blind, he says to these Pharisees, then you would see. But because you say you see when you're blind, here you are out in the sea, as I say. If you thought that you were going to drown, if you knew you were gone, then you'd grab this lifesaver. But as long as you think you can make it on your own and despise it, you'll never be. He's coming, in other words, you see. This is what throws everybody off here. He's coming to save everybody who's really blind. We're all blind, yes, but we don't know it. He comes to every sinner, but we're all sinners, but we don't admit it. So he really comes to everybody who's a sinner and admits it, to everybody who needs faith and believes, to everybody who's blind and asks to have his eyes open to him, then he will have it. Now, take, for example, that, uh, the, I think one of the things that's probably running through your mind at this point here, and it's, it's a part of this contemporary corruption here. I mean, that's one thing. You can't be loose in theology at one point and tight at all the other points and so on. If you get loose at one point, you usually, it's like a string, you, the whole strand comes off and so on. Now, the problem at this point, and the reason people can fall into this error that Christ came to save every particular person, is the supposition that every particular person can of himself respond to Jesus Christ. If you ever get this doctrine of total depravity clearly in your mind, if you ever realize that you're dead in trespassing, you don't only need an offer of salvation, but you need an actual application of salvation, then, of course, you'll be otherwise. But because everybody thinks, I remember one, one of our leaders, for example, going on TV at one time and saying, if we can make Christ clear to the American people, they'll all come running. Our problem is that they have all sorts of uh, mythical ideas about him, erroneous ideas about him. Now, if we can teach soundly who Jesus Christ is, if, he, if we can lift him up in all of his exalted excellence and so on, you won't be able to keep the people away. That's the head of Campus Crusade who's saying that sort of thing. That's a tremendously successful organization in a certain way all over the world. It has a Harvard efficiency expert operating behind the scenes on the thing. It's a very, very impressive organization. But this is a fundamental philosophy of it. It's fundamental. It's to believe in the inspired word of God. It believes the deity of Jesus Christ. It believes in faith through and salvation thereby and so on. It believes the whole package of fundamentalism with an unswerving and admirable devotion at that particular point. But it also believes that people have it in their hearts to be drawn by Jesus Christ when he is simply presented to them as he really is. And it's once again based on a misunderstanding of the Bible, based especially on Jesus' words, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Bill and just about everybody else believes that if you present Jesus Christ, he will draw everybody to him. What's wrong with that? Let's see, once again, when he is lifted up, he draws people from all the world to him who recognize their need of him. But those who don't are absolutely repelled by him. And when you present Christ in his genuine purity, just as we have in John 6, you have a great exodus. And Christ is turning to his apostles, you remember, and he said, are you two going to leave me? You remember their answer? Remember their answer? You have the words of eternal life. To whom else can we go? Everybody else may leave you, but they're leaving the only fount of life. They're the only source of of eternal health, and so on. How can we leave you? And so on. But you see, here it is. Once again, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men. Bill is undoubtedly reading into that. He'll draw each and every individual. It's absolutely false. He will repel each and every individual who is not inwardly persuaded of him. But you see, you ask the question, why in the world aren't they attracted to him? They're drowning. They're blind. He's the person who can heal. He's the person who can save. And so why didn't everybody come rushing? Well, that's where I like to tell my story about Emily Post's etiquette book and so on. It's a very useful book, especially if you're getting married or you're having some relatives or some space, state function or something. You want to know where the forks and the spoons and so on ought to be and what's the order of protocol and all the rest of it. 
very useful book. It used to sell for $10. I suppose it's fifteen ninety-five now or something like that, or maybe Amy Vanderbilt's book. It doesn't make any difference. But why is it that you're insulted if somebody gives it to you? And while it's a very useful book and you're saving yourself $16, nevertheless, you don't want it because it carries the implication that you need it. And if you have any self-pride and such things as that, you don't like other people going around telling you, even though it costs them $16 to do so, that you are ignorant to, as a, to the ways of, of etiquette. Well, this is what keeps us from being attracted to Jesus Christ. The only way you can do it is by admitting you're an absolutely bankrupt sinner. That's too high a price for proud people. That was too high a price for these Pharisees. It wasn't too high a price for a man born blind who knew he'd been born blind. But you wonder why it doesn't work. But anyway, that's the fundamental fallacy in that argument number four. He has moved from the undisputed point that anybody in the world who believes will be saved, that Jesus Christ came to be the Savior of anybody in the world who believes, to the absolutely fallacious conclusion that Jesus Christ came to save everybody in the world. Now let's take a look at his, uh, his uh, any question about argument number four before we go to question number five, argument number five. And as I say, with the rest of the course after Easter, we'll be devoted to the uh, proofs of point number six, which is essentially the same. But here's the, here's the fifth argument which um, Thomas More gives for the proposition that Jesus Christ died to save everybody. That which God will one day cause every man to confess to the glory of God is certainly a truth. For God will own no lie for his glory, John 13, 3 and 9, etc. But God will one day cause every man to confess Jesus by virtue of his death and ransom given to be Lord, even to the glory of God, Philippians 2, etc. Therefore, it is certainly a truth that Jesus Christ hath given himself a ransom for all men, and hath thereby the right of leadership over lordship over them. And if any will not believe and come into this government, yet he abideth faithful and cannot deny himself, but will one day bring them before him and cause them to confess him Lord to the glory of God when they shall be not denied by him for denying him in the days of his patience, etc. I won't comment it, but if you notice carefully, there's actually a little switch there between the confessing reluctantly by people who are conquered by him in the last day and those who confess him gladly as true believers. But that's a minor point, and we'll let that go. You can see his fundamental argument at this particular point, that everybody should confess Christ to be Lord, and they, everybody will confess Christ to be Lord. Therefore, since Christ will be co confessed to be Lord, I'll we'll put it this way, since Christ will be confessed Lord by everybody, and, and since, oh, wait a minute, since Christ will be confessed Lord by everybody, ultimately, in the days to come, and since Christ did die a ransom, therefore, Christ died a ransom for everybody who will sometime confess him Lord. This is the reason I wanted you to do your own homework on this. If you just spell it out as an argument, I think you can see how fallacious it is. You're just bombarded with biblical data so that you suppose it must be biblical because this person is, he's probably sincere. I don't think he's trying deliberately to confuse people. He's not a, I'm not accusing Thomas More of a hypocrite, of being a hypocrite and deliberately trying to deceive. I think he honestly believes this himself. He not only honestly believes it himself, he honestly believes it's biblical. This is the vast majority of people we refer to today believe this is biblical. If he ever looked at his argument and the simplicity of it, he'd realize it had nothing to do with biblicality at all as far as the argument is concerned. Christ will be confessed by everybody. And it is a fact that the Christ who will be confessed it does indeed, has indeed died a ransom. But it doesn't follow that he died a ransom for everybody who would confess him, Lord. I think you can see the little slippage in the, in the thinking there, just as it was in that 
uh, for first particular point, but if not, uh, any questions about the actual analysis of the argument and the, the fallacy of the reasoning and thereby, of course, the, I don't say willful, but nevertheless serious mishandling of Scripture. This is what makes this so dangerous. You see, if this man was just a sloppy thinker, that would be bad enough. He wouldn't make, he, he, he probably would flunk his course in logic in, at WSU or something like that. But this is a man who's propagating the gospel through this sloppy type of thinking. And if you are careful and get caught in with it, this is the point where you say, well, Gerson, you and Owen and people like that have to handle that. Yeah, we do have to handle it. We're the ones who have to write the books on it and such things as that. But you're the people who have to live with it. And as I say, you can be perfectly sure if 90% of the people are preaching this other doc, uh, 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 theologians are preaching this other doctrine, most of the people who listen to them, especially since they cite Bible all the time, are going along with it. So you can, I can't be doing your job for you. I have to do my job, and Owen has to do his job, and so on. But you've got to do your job, and that is see through this type of thing. It takes an effort. You, gotta, you just simply have to think. As I say, I've said more times than what I say it again here because it's a very great concern where it concerns you, not just me, but you as well. You are under command to love God with all your mind, not 10% of it, not 15% of it, and not to use your best part of your brain for your professional work, and that's all. And when it comes to the Bible, any kind of subsidiary type of thought will do it. It's not, you're not a professional as I'm a professional, and you don't have to give 100% of your time to it as I have to give the time to it. But you do have to give 100% of your brain matter in the time you do have to this particular thing. You've got to see through things like it. After all, we're talking about eternal life and death. It's a very serious error. Very, very serious error. I wouldn't say that everybody who made it is therefore lost. But nevertheless, it's a very great and damaging thing. And as I said in the very first lecture, you're on the, sl you're on the slippery slope. It's just about impossible for a person to believe that Jesus Christ intended to save everybody and stop short of saying he saved everybody. As I said before, once you say that, Christ intended to save everybody, and he failed in his effort. You choke on that. You know full well Christ can't fail. You know God can't send him on an errand he can't accomplish. And if he doesn't accomplish it, then nobody's going to say he did accomplish it and still be evangelical. Nobody's going to fall into universal salvation and still be, uh, be that. You see the problem. You're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. You're in a hard place here. The rock in a hard place. You've got one way or the other. If this universal intention would lead to universal salvation, and that's heresy. But if you deny the universal salvation and try to hang on to universal intention, then you have something just about as bad, namely what? Divine frustration. The inability of God to carry out a purpose he's had from all eternity. And I, I can't even say that without choking on my words, and you can't listen to it and believe that you're hearing a rational human being speak. I'm not talking about a Calvinist speak. I'm talking about a rational human being right now. Uh, speak. We've got a course going on now about rational Christianity. Praise God. I think there is no other kind of Christianity except rational Christianity. That's not the same thing as saying technical, you understand. But uh, you are as responsible as I am for rational Christianity as, as well. But uh, let, me, uh, let me say on this particular point, since you apparently have no question before I get to these other questions which were submitted last week. And by the way, you can always do that if you want to raise... Put, give me questions on a card or something before, during, or after the class if you don't want to speak uh, uh, publicly to it. But let me just mention once again how this gets over to people and how so many people fall into this particular trap is the constant repetition of it. And here's uh, that's the reason I've selected this. Here's a man who gives six presumably solid arguments with 18 subproofs for the sixth point and so on. All of it as biblical as possible, just heaping text after text after text upon you, and so on. And if you are inattentive, you're almost inevitably going to be sucked into this particular uh, pull uh, here. But uh, I think I mentioned to you once about this uh, dialogue, somebody somewhere once about this dialogue I had with some Mormons some years ago in a uh, suburb of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the best place in the world to live. I hope you noticed that. You come in at 127th place. What am I doing down here in Wichita? <laughs> Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, number one to come to the 127th place and proud of it and so on. <laughs> because somebody else is 336. <laughs> I got a kick out of that. But anyway, this was in a suburb of uh, Pittsburgh. The Mormons were. And an interesting article I noticed yesterday in your religious supplement on the Mormons and the people who are showing this film and such things as that. The Mormons are definitely not Christian. It's a perfectly obvious thing. I haven't seen the film. I don't know whether it's a good, bad, or indifferent film of Mormonism, but there's no question at all that Mormonism does, 
as we were showing the other day, is actually a polytheistic cult, not just a, a heretical pr Christian group. But at any rate, these Mormons were intensely uh, circulating their doctrines in this uh, area. And uh, the thing about them is so different from most of the other cults. They like to pass as Christian. They do everything but give an altar call in the, uh, in the presentations. And this harried minister, one of our churches in the suburb of Pittsburgh, said, come on over and help us, Gerstner, and so on. These Mormons at the door are virtually uh, trying to evangelize uh, our people. So to make a long story short, I agreed to it, and there was about a dozen of us that night in an upper room somewhere. Two of the Mormons and myself and the others were evangelical Christians, but it was understood. In other words, a couple of the Mormons, too. It was understood it was dialogue between this leader of the Mormons and myself. And I said to him at the outset, you pick the subject. I stipulate only one thing. You stick to it. No rambling, no beating around the bush. And we, dis we dispose of the question. All right. So he chose the subject. And I was delighted because it's a major subject. God has a body, the corporeality of, uh, of the deity. God has a body. Now, you know full well that anybody who believes that has to be a heretic. How in the world can anybody have a sound doctrine of God who's a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, and so on, think he has a body. Now, there's no dispute about that. They do, and that, as I say, when I asked this man to choose his own subject, this is the subject he chose. Well, again, we went through the text of the Bible, and here again, the Bible, you see, that's all you need. They may have the Book of Mormon, and they have a pearl of great price, and they may have a thing about uh, Abraham and all the rest of it, but if they once believe the Bible's the Word of God, they're gone. Mormonism couldn't possibly survive if you just hold her to the principles of the Bible. In this, in this particular case, he chose this subject, and he chose the text of the Bible we go to. And he started with, uh, number one was uh, uh, Adam had a body, no question. Adam was made in the image of God, no question. Ergo, therefore, God had a body also. I went through that, and about 20 minutes later, he gave that up as a proof. And then he gave a second, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth argument from the Bible that God had a body. We, and I wouldn't let him stray from that. We just stayed with that. There was no changing the subject. He gave one, two, three, four, five. And anybody there would tell you he gave up number one, he gave up number two, he gave up number three, he gave up number four, and he gave up number five as proving what they were supposed to prove, namely that God had a body. And then I said, well, and you know what he said to me at that juncture? Well, don't you admit the cumulative effect? The cumulative effect. <laughs> five zero. It was a cumulative effect of five zero. But you see, he was sharp that way. It's the cumulative effect of Thomas More. It's a cumulative effect of you hearing it on the TV and on the radio day in and day out. You can't, you, you just gradually suppose so many people can't be saying that without being true. There's not a shred of an argument at any point. You add zero to zero to zero to zero, and after all, it comes up with a number. The so-called cumulative effect. Now, here it is once again. Jesus Christ uh, is going to be confessed Lord by everybody. Jesus Christ did die a ransom. Therefore, Jesus Christ died a ransom for everybody. Now, you can hear that kind of an argument every hour on the hour, and it says zero after zero after zero, but if you don't watch yourself, this is where you come in. You're really lazy and indolent, and most professed Christian people are hopelessly lazy. I told you about that Sterling guy who turned pale when I convinced him of the fact that he's supposed to think in his classes about God and so he never, never crossed his mind that it had a thing to do with his religion. It may never have crossed your mind, but it, it should cross your mind. It better cross your mind, and so on. A cumulative effect of, uh, of zero. But since there are only about ten minutes left, let me look at these rather heavy questions. But before that, before that any question about what we've gone so, through so far in John Owen's uh, critique is given in a sort of uh, semi-popular form by John Gershner. Okay? Yes, sir, John. Yeah, there, in his fifth argument, after the therefore, uh, something bothers me. It doesn't, doesn't quite add up to me here. Uh, it is only, he is, Thomas More is only saying that it is because Christ has died a ransom that he has a right to be Lord. Right. Mm -hmm. And... You know, if he wanted to do that, you see, he could do that, but then he died a ransom only for the elect, so he'll only have a right to be the uh, Lord of the elect, but he knows, uh, he knows full well he's the Lord of everybody. Take that passage in Philippians 2 he cites. It's especially because Jesus Christ was obedient even unto death that God exalted him. The thing about it being obedient unto death for everybody, and so on. See, if he's going to make an argument like that, if Christ is Lord of everybody, then he must have been a ransom for everybody, then you'd make that the argument. But that argument is obviously would fall on his face just to mention it. He's the Lord of everybody because he's the Lord. 
He's the creator and a sustainer of everybody. And he is specifically referred to as that being exalted in Philippians 2 because he died and so on. But that doesn't say he died for everybody. And that's what he's trying to prove. You see, you have to keep your eye on the ball all the time. What is it that Thomas More is trying to prove? Most of the things he said, we all agree with. There's no argument about it. There's nothing to prove there. We all admit that, you see. We're listening to see how what we do recognize as true and admit as so on leads to what we think is false and so on. Every time the argument just dissipates, it's just not there and so on. The cumulative effect is all you have to do with it. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> what is the unpardonable sin? I think the unpardonable sin, especially in Matthew, is the attributing of the works of Christ to the devil. You do these things by the power of Beelzebub, and, and it's a sin against the Holy Ghost because Christ's works were done by the Holy Ghost. They were attributed by these leaders who were opposed to Christ to the unholy spirit, namely the devil, and so on. Let me get to these two questions, which are, are several questions which were written here, that uh, are a problem for us. In a certain sense, I'm saying by us, I mean people who recognize the basic Reformed truth at stake here and what John Owen is saying, and so on. This is a sort of intramural question. It's almost as if we say, all right, let's grant. Moore is wrong. He's wrong on all six points and all of the subsequent 18 proofs and so on. Let's, let's say, granted that. Now let's look internally at our own problems and so on here. And, and I think that's the spirit in which this question was given. Is God's wrath vented toward the unbeliever who is elect but not yet regenerated? The Bible teaches that the wrath of God, John 3 especially, rests upon all who do not believe. Now, we're all born unbelievers. Elect and reprobate alike are born unbelievers. This question, therefore, has to do with the status of the elect while they're still unregenerate. Is God's wrath vented or felt or resting upon the unbeliever who is elect but not yet regenerate. Definitely so. The Bible says very plainly that the one who does not believe, everybody in this room was born an unbeliever. A number of you live many years as an unbeliever. During all those years, the wrath of God was thoroughly upon you. If you said, suppose I died before I come to faith, <laughs> you know the answer to that, don't you? The elect will not die before they come to faith. The elect will be brought to faith, even if you're an elect person like that thief on the cross, it may be the last moments of your life. If that's the moment that's appointed, but you will not die with the wrath of God upon you. But you are under the wrath of God all that time. The second question, if the answer is yes, and that's my answer to that, yes, is God loving and hating the elect person at the same time? The answer, once again, is yes. And it brings us back to the most important distinction we can get on this particular point. The love of God as a love of benevolence and the love of God as a love of complacency. This comes literally from the Latin, well, will, willing well. Now this kind of a love God has for everybody. And when it says his mercy is over all his works, for example, and he's the savior of all men, especially of those that believe, it's an indication that God has a good will toward everybody, sinner and saint alike. That's what accounts for his living at all. It's the only reason he isn't born in hell. The only reason he lives at all, the only reason he has clothes on his back or shelter over his head or food in his stomach or a job or a family or anything else that he calls dear in life is the beneficence of a deity who has no love of complacency for him, whatever. He is a sinner. The thoughts and intents of his heart are only evil continually. And God abhors the wicked. God is angry with the wicked every day, Psalm 711. His wrath rests upon them. Now here we're ta uh, talking about the elect before their regeneration. And the question is, does God love and hate them? And the answer is yes. He hates them as far as their character is concerned. He hated you as long as you were in unregenerate state. If you died in that condition, you would certainly perish under his wrath forever. You don't do anything that is good ever. As I say, you sometimes do bad good works. You do outwardly good things. You may have an honorable calling. 
and you may bear your children, and you may do your job, and you may pay your debts and such things as that, all of which are good, but as long as your heart is evil, how can you being evil know how to give good gifts? You don't know how to give them because the only way you can really give good gifts is with a good heart. If you don't have a good heart, they're bad, good works. So all you do is evil, and God has no complacency in you. You're the exact antithesis of his son, of whom he says, this is my beloved, beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. He never sinned. He had no sin in his nature, and he never did sin. He died for sin. He became sin, that you might become the righteousness of God in him. But God was pleased with him even when he died and descended into hell on the cross, as it were, enduring the wrath of God in your stead. But you, as an elect person, before your regeneration, you were the beneficiaries, as all people are, whether elect or reprobate, of God's benevolence. But you had no love of complacency. You had nothing but detestation and hatred. He wouldn't have you in his presence. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. You didn't see God except that the God of wrath. And you tried to escape him, and you repressed him, and his wrath was upon you. So the answer to that question about the elect is, and the non-elect at this point, God has both love of benevolence and a love of complacency. If no, but the answer is yes on that point, so I'll say it. But let me explain this a little further. The real difference now between those for whom Christ died, those who have been elect from all eternity, and those who are not, is the degree of this love of benevolence. The non-elect have what we call common grace. The elect have saving as well as common grace. This love of benevolence. As you see, all people in this world, and usually those who are not elect, have the greatest measure of common grace. That is, generally speaking, your geniuses. A few exceptions here and there. Generally speaking, he doesn't call many wise or many great. It's the small things of the world that confound the mighty and so on. It's the non-elect who have most money, most gifts, most influence, most power. There are exceptions. But generally speaking, they have more of common grace than the elect, but all people have some uh, common grace. But in just a love of benevolence, there's no complacency in it with either the elect or the non-elect before conversion. Now, the difference here is that while we were born dead in trespasses and sins, and while the wrath of God was upon us, and while we were still the recipients of common grace by all the benefits of this life and so on, God also had a saving intention. He had the intention to give to us not only our daily bread, not only a job, not only life, not only comfort and health and, and uh, the pleasures we have and so on, not only that, which he gives to others and in greater abundance than he gives to the elect generally, but also the intention of giving Jesus Christ to die for us and to reconcile us to God and adopt us into his family and unite him with the elect in regeneration forever and ever. And that passage, you know, in Timothy where it says God is a savior of all men, especially of the elect. Especially of the elect. Especially of those who believe, I should say, the same thing. He's the Savior of all men. You see the way he's the Savior of all men by common grace. That which gives them life, that's what keeps them in life. No one exists in this world, a solitary moment, except by the good pleasure of him in whom we live and move and have our being. That famous sermon of Edwards on sinners in the hands of an angry God was so powerful because the way it was phrased was, nothing keeps the sinner out of hell a solitary moment except the sheer good pleasure of a God who is infinitely angry with him. And when that came over to those people of Northampton and Enfield and so on, there's no wonder they hang, hung under the pillars of the, of the church and so on. But that's true of any of you here who are not in Christ Jesus at this moment. The only thing that keeps you out of hell is the mere good pleasure of a God who is infinitely angry with you. You have the opportunity of coming. Say a moment ago, the, the offer is given to everybody. And anybody who will believe in this room, in this world, will be saved if you sin away your day of grace and so on. He's the savior of the world, of all men in that sense of the word, but especially 
that is, in eternal salvation, only of those who uh, believe. I guess the time is uh, up, so I'll have to...